Hello everyone, thanks for joining today's webinar. Uh, before we start, I just wanted to mention that you're all muted because we expect many people on the line today. We do of course encourage you to ask questions, but you can do that using the Q&A functionality. You should be able to see a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we will monitor the questions that come in. Uh, we can answer some uh, already during the webinar and we'll save the others um, for when the speakers are done. And we will also be sharing a recording of the webinar afterwards. So today we're talking about the data site pit graph, uh, which we developed um, as part of the European project Freya. Uh, if we move to the next slide, you can see the agenda for today. So first, Robin will tell you a bit more about the concept behind the pit graph, what the pit graph actually is. Then Martin will talk about how we built the data site pit graph. And Christian will tell you a bit more about the kinds of questions you can ask the pit graph. And then, as I said, we'll have time for a Q&A session. So Robin, over to you. OK, great. Thanks. Um, so yes, so my part of this is to introduce what is the PID graph anyway, um, because this is kind of a tricky concept we've taken from one of our uh, European Union funded projects, the Freya project, and this is uh, causing some confusion for people. So we're going to talk a little bit about what the PID graph actually is. So really, the approach that we came, uh, the approach that we use for this in Freya is uh, thinking about research um, as already being a graph. So researchers, institutions, publications, data sets, all that stuff are already connected um, just by virtue of being created by different people and being related to different people. And all of those sort of entities and relationships between these different items already form kind of a conceptual graph of the connected research landscape. And really what we want to do through Freya and through these persistent identifiers is to make that conceptual graph into something that's more actually traversable by uh, humans and machines. So to do this, we really consider um, PIDs to be the backbone of connected research, uh, of connected research um, persistent identifiers. So having unique persistent identifiers or PIDs for researchers and their outputs is crucial to connecting pieces of the research landscape together. And we say that it's, that it's crucial, what we really mean here is that unique PIDs, and especially in the case of the connections, the metadata that backs them, is uh, what helps enable machines to make these connections for us. So it's much easier to point to specific things when they're all uniquely identified. And by having this sort of standardized uh, metadata and these unique IDs within the metadata, it makes it a lot easier for us to all point to each other's stuff. Um, so we think that, that PIDs already have the potential to enable this kind of connected research graph that we're talking about, but we're not yet really taking full advantage of their connecting powers the way that we really could be. And so that's what we envision for the PID graph. So the idea behind the PID graph is that we can link these different PIDs together uh, through relations in their metadata. So when one PID says it's related to another PID through some kind of related identifier scheme, um, and we can um, link all these together to enable the discovery of connections that are at least two hops away, we might say. So the, hopefully the diagram helps explain this a little bit. Um, the idea currently is that between item A and item B, we might already know the relation between the two of them from their metadata. So for instance, if A was an author, we might know that they uh, wrote a particular publication, for instance, uh, by virtue of that being in that author's ORCID record. So from the metadata that is included with that PID, we already know the relationship between A and B. And we might have something similar happening for B and C. Again, if B is a publication and C is a data set, we might know from the metadata from either the publication or the data set that uh, B and C are also related. So there's certain things we already know just by virtue of the metadata that a PID contains um, or that a PID is related to. Um, but what we're really looking forward uh, to doing with the PID graph is being able to figure out that relationship between A and C. So knowing that A authored B and B was based on data set C, we could then be able to say that author A is in some way related to data set C. And it's kind of those two hops away that we're really focusing on right now with the PID graph. So I'll tell you a little bit about the PID graph concept. So as Helena mentioned, this is part of our work on an EU funded project called Project Freya. Um, and the idea here is that the various Freya partners, of which DataSite is one, uh, will implement services that enable their own local PID graph, that will enable the PID graph for their particular PIDs that they hold and uh, the, the PIDs that they have access to. 
And the idea would be that looking up a single PID in those services should return the graph for that PID, all the things that it was related to. Um, and then the various infrastructural partners like DataSite, the people who make the infrastructure that helps some of this stuff run, um, through us and through the magic of these related identifiers that are in the metadata, we can help bring all of these local graphs together. And then the idea would be that users, um, external users, can then tap into that PID graph to use in their own applications and to make their own implementations of the PID graph and so on and so forth. So that's kind of the general concept that we're working with here, this kind of federated system of, um, of multiple PID graphs all coming together. And so I think we should really emphasize at this point um, that the PID graph really is a framework so at this stage of the game, uh, the PID graph is just a framework for connecting the PIDs. By the end of Freya, we will not have a single standalone entity or web service that is the sole PID graph. Um, so we're not looking at this point at creating a giant all-encompassing PID graph that someone can just you know, go to a website and push a button and, and get a giant graph. Um, again, we're kind of working from that federated concept that I described earlier. So the Freya team will be producing APIs, will be producing documentation for this, um, examples of how you can use the PID graph. We're doing some cool stuff with Jupyter Notebooks in that regard. Um, and then we'll also be um, doing our own implementations based on this kind of framework that we're working on. Um, and by the end of Freya, developers at other institutions will then have what they need to implement their own PID graph services to take this work forward. So with that, um, Let's talk a little bit about data sites implementation of the PID graph. And that's really kind of what the rest of this is going to be about the rest of the session today. So we are building a GraphQL API specifically suited for querying the PID graph. Um, and we're using the power of our metadata plus connections to Crossref and ORCID as kind of some of the other large infrastructural sort of people um, to present information on the connections our users have, uh, have indicated to us in the related identifiers of their DOIs. Um, and so by using this GraphQL API, anybody can then consume this body of information um, that we are making available through the power of connected metadata. So then the question we often get from people at this stage when we're talking about the PID graph and sort of explaining the concept and what it means, um, we get people asking, how can I get my stuff in the PID graph? And again, to emphasize, at the end of Freya, we will not have one sole gigantic single PID graph. Um, but there are some ways you can get your stuff into data sites PID graph in a way. So for data site members, um, if you're already creating DOIs via data site, any of the metadata you provide to us that is findable and your public metadata uh, will be exposed by our implementation of the PID graph. Um, that's ultimately the goal here. Um, we're currently working on this with the GraphQL API, but eventually that's the idea of exposing all the metadata you provide to us. So this means you should remember to include related identifiers because we can't make a graph if there's no connections between things. <laughs> so if you want your stuff to be showing that it's connected to all this different stuff, if you wanna show that your data sets are connected to the researchers at your institutions or to different uh, publications and so on and so forth, then you need to make sure to include those related identifiers that you know about in the metadata that you submit to data site because otherwise we won't know about it and we won't be able to actually serve up these connections to people when they search for your stuff. Um, and so then through data sites collaboration with these Freya partners and other people like Crossref and ORCID and such, um, your related identifiers will then be connected with other things like Crossref IDs and, uh, and um, sorry, ORCID IDs and Crossref DOIs. So we'll be able to connect all these things together. Now, if you're not a member of data site, um, for now, you'll still need to have some technical know-how to be able to construct your own PID graph implementation. Um, but a lot of the stuff we do at data site is open source. And so you'll be able to check out the kind of stuff we've done if you want to see um, a similar way to, to a similar approach to use uh, to be able to do this for yourself. Um, so you can check out our GraphQL implementation at the link that I've provided. This is kind of rolled up into into our broader um, our broader all-in-one API, uh, but you can see what we're doing here at that link. And then as I sort of alluded to previously, we're also working on um, making a nice pile of example Jupyter notebooks that you can use um, to navigate the PID graph and to try to explore some of the questions that you can answer with the PID graph, uh, which is some of the stuff that Martin and Christian are going to talk about next. So then with that, I will turn it over to Martin to talk about how we built the PID graph. And I'll stop sharing my part so he can take that over. Thank you, Robin. So I will now talk about our initial work, how we built the PID graph, and I hope you can all see my slides as well. 
it's not full screen, uh, Martin. Oh yeah, of course. <laughs> okay, so I hope that's better. So um, the first question is, what do you put in the pick graph? What kind of resources? And just to, to get you started, um, I share this word cloud that we generated at the last research data lines plenary in April. Sort of what kind of things uh, you would like to see connected in a pit graph uh, in the audience of a total of about 35 people gave these answers and there are some obvious things in there obviously research data um, people uh, software was very high on the list but also uh, other things so this you can clearly see pit graph can very simply or very easily go uh, in all kinds of directions become very complicated um, and you also see things on there where PITs are still at an early stage. So for example, instruments and metadata linking these PITs to other things. So um, this is probably more the future if you think about uh, what we can achieve now. Then a good starting point is uh, what Research Graph, a very related initiative that started out in the research data lines uh, is using for their graph and they're focusing on researchers, research data, publication and grants. And uh, we fully agree that research data sits in the center. You see similar pictures where maybe, depending on where it comes from, the research or the publication sits in the center. There's a few things uh, that we're close enough to, uh, that this is sort of common interest in adding them. And it also where the PITs and the metadata are evolved enough, which could, for example, be software organizations um, funders, um, but this is a this is a good starting point, and Research Graph has been doing this for for several years, and that covers a lot of territory. Um, what you need is resources like data sets and publications that come with PITs and with metadata. The metadata fall in two categories. One is describing metadata. This is the name of the researcher or the title of the publication and linking metadata, which is usually two pits linked together. Uh, this is sort of, for example, linked to an author via his or her ORCID identifier, uh, citations via their identifiers, funding, etc. So that's a very generic concept. What you need is pits that have rich metadata support this. Some pits can only be at a receiving end. So for example, across their funder ID, is an important identifier, but the system itself doesn't store any links to other PITs. It's only sort of linked to, if you will. The next step then is to, to take the linking metadata and sort of look at them separately, process them, et cetera, and you end up with sort of all the linking metadata from one data set, for example, might be 10 citations, two funding references, and three authors with their identifiers. And you basically want to sort of break this down into atomic pieces and, and put it all together. Um, so that at the end, you have resources described by PITs and describing metadata, and you have the connections between two PITs, uh, which also come with some metadata maybe um, so the kind of relation is described, but it's basically connections between two pits. And I think you know where this is going, that then you have different systems for this, that the data side, for example, we have APIs that describe DUIs and DUI metadata, and we have a system called event data that just focuses on, on these links, on these connections, and this is exactly also what, for example, the RDA SCOLIX framework is doing. Um, that sort of for these connections, it's much easier to work with them if you just make them atomic and just have connections between two pits uh, as, uh, at the simples level. And this is sort of, we have been at this point uh, already for a few years with things like event data and colleagues. Um, but what we're trying now in pit graph is bringing this together again <clears throat> and we decided and that was only a few months ago, that we think GraphQL is the right technology to do this because it allows you to bring all these uh, connections and resources together. 
um, allow sophisticated queries. Sophisticated means, for example, you can query not only in one place, you can query all the data sets of, for example, a particular keyword, then look at all the linked um, publications and again do a query there, etc. And with GraphQL, you can also decide what you want to show. And I see in my example, I didn't do a good job because you see the results for this query on the right side where the authors in this first example of this data set that you see on the right side for this query out of the 6 million data sets we currently have in our system that the first few authors didn't have an ORCID, which is not unusual. It's uh, something that's not so widespread yet. Unfortunately, every author necessarily has an ORCID metadata, but, but you get the point how this works. And GraphQL is really the key technology for enabling queries for bringing the pieces uh, back together. And uh, this is a technology which is quite popular and is open source and there's libraries in every language you might be using. But in a scholarly community is not yet so widely used. And we think that's a mistake and we try to push this technology because we think this is a perfect fit to what we try to do with PitGraph which is that everything is a graph, that every resource in a graph or every node in a graph can be described by a globally unique identifier, which is, of course, the PID. Uh, there is a standardized query interface. No matter how you access the PID graph, what you are interested in, for where you come, it's always the same, and that makes it much, much easier to build client application. And uh, also very important, this is a query interface. The backend services are exactly as before. We didn't have to build new databases, search indexes, APIs in the background that can all be reused. It's really the query interface that has changed. And here you see the um, API endpoint, which we made available two months ago. And we call it pre-release because it is still changing. We're adding more things. We're enabling more kinds of queries, etc. But it's totally fine to use it, and there you will find millions of resources in there. What is also important that GraphQL supports federation, so that the GraphQL API endpoint that we provide a data site not only queries data site but also briefly data raw, cross your funder registry and ORCID partially. Partially means if you have an ORCID identifier, it will return information about that person. And um, integrating the various PID services that sit in different places together via GraphQL and also have deeper integrations that allow more sophisticated, that's something that we're working on in a Freya project. <clears throat> GraphQL is um, uh, for somebody who is used to work with APIs is relatively straightforward, but it's still a hurdle to explore the PID graph. And to make this easier, we started to provide example Jupyter Notebooks uh, to work with this API. And uh, this is an example using R. Um, and R has a GraphQL library that we have included here. The same is true for other languages that are commonly used with Jupyter Notebooks like Python. So there are standard libraries, which means the queries are always the same, and you can really focus on writing notebooks that answer your questions instead of uh, spending a lot of time building a technology solution to work uh, with the GraphQL APIs that we use for PID graph. And this is my final slide to just give you an example of a Jupyter Notebook showing a graph of all the data sets, publications, and researchers connected to a particular grant, which is the Freya grant, um, showing that, uh, as Robin showed earlier, that the connections in the graph can be quite complex, even for such a small number of resources, and um, confusing, but also giving you much more information about interesting relationships um, in this graph. and. Uh, visualizations of the PID graph using Jupyter Notebooks is a typical use case, something you can do now 
and can go deep to answer all kinds of questions, which is exactly uh, what we will talk about in the last section, and Christian will guide you through that. Thank you, Martin. Um, okay, so yeah, now it's time to talk about what can you get uh, out of this work at the moment. As Martin mentioned, we are currently releasing the GraphQL API for the BitGraph as a pre-release version, and this means that uh, the API, uh, well, this API being like the primary access point for PhDGraph at the moment, you can expect that there will be some functionality, but we will be adding for the functionality in the near future, uh, both as part of data site uh, development work and part of the Freya project. But now I want to show you what can you ask at the moment. And I'm going to talk about four specific questions that you can make to the PID graph. And hopefully that will give you a grasp of the type of questions that you can make and the type of questions that you can expect to make in the near future. These questions are based around specific resources. Uh, specific resources, these are things that, that I, I guess everybody in the audience is familiar with. Uh, this would be data, center, data centers. Funding, grant, funding grants, researchers, and scientific software. So, now I could we go to the next slide, please? I think, Martin, you are with control. Yeah, thank you. So, the first question is about data centers. And data centers are, in essence, a collection of data sets. They are the registered DOI metadata, for, but in many cases, they are completely separated of the entity that collects all the citation data. And these data centers, they are probably identified with an identifier, and those identifiers are connected in certain way to the, to the data sets. And those data sets have related identifiers connected to the other items making these citations. So in the PID graph, you can make questions such as, how many citations does a data center have? And next, please. Um, and when you ask that question, uh, you will get a list with all the citations uh, and, all the, and all the items from that data center. Here, I'm taking an example of the London School of Economics and bringing all that information in. And this is a common response that you will get when you ask a question using the GraphQL API in PID Graph. And I don't want you to bug you too much with what this JSON response is, uh, but it's a very standard JSON response and really, uh, we think that it's really clear. But I'm going to, this is really easy to transform this actually to something more legible. As Martin said, uh, this is, we are using this technology because it will be really easy. We think it will be really easy for anybody else to implement their own uh, systems and create applications that's that. So if I transform this into a table, and Martin will help me with that, and it will look like something like this. And I know it's massive, but it's practically the same information into a table. It's a very good example, but I, I hope that can elicitate what we got when we asked that question. And I think at the top, you can see just the, all the information that, for in this case, the London School of Economics already know about the data center, that they have 433 publications that you see on the top, on the top rows, and a list of all the publications they have, as you see in the left columns in the screen. You will also get, get the who created these publications and their archives IDs for those that have them. And as you know, not everybody has one. But the important part is the part, the column on the far right. And this one is about all the information that comes from related identifiers. And this is information that in many cases, in this specific example, the London School Economics uh, Data Center or repository does not have knowledge about these citations. And this is the stuff that the PID graph will bring you in when you ask questions such as this one. Um, the next question that I want to talk about is about funding grants. Um, this this are uh, incredibly important. Funders would like to get be able to get an indication of the impact of the grants and as well as the specific in benefits, uh, individuals that benefit of these grants. And by nature of using the persistence identifiers, we get the possibility to ask questions about them. So one could ask a question such as what grants, uh, what's the PID graph for a specific grant publication? And if you go to the next slide, um, here I'm going to take a specific uh, grant, grant, uh, grant uh, funded project, that's the Freya project, which is the one that's as mentioned earlier by Robin, 
in which the data site is working. And, and you can ask what's the PID graph for all the publications of the Freya, uh, Freya uh, project. And what you will get is all the items that actually are related to that grant. Again, you get this response that is still in very standard uh, compared with the other one. If we go to the next slide. Uh, and this is actually something that Martin showed earlier, that actually that same response you get taken and transform into this graph that represents actually all the items in that, uh, uh, all the items connected to that grant, that specific funder, uh, grant funding, which is the, the yellow dot in the middle, and it's connected to all these other items being researchers, publications, and funders. And you can get that graph precisely from from that response from the GraphQL API that comes from the PID graph. But I want to show you how, again, this in a less abstract way, just in a table, and, and this will be kind of the list that you will get uh, from that one. Uh, and I, here is separated into two massive tables, practically. The table at the top shows the, how many data sets are related to this grant funded project, and the table at the bottom shows uh, how many publications are there related to that one, you will see number two at the very top of the table, the first one, and in the middle second one, you will get 20, so there are 20 publications there, all of them related uh, to this grant, uh, grant, uh, uh, grant funded project, and also, and you will get practically all the ORCID ideas for those ones that I have included together with the, uh, all the related identifiers that these publications that are there have, and these related identifiers are actually many of the notes that are in that graph. Uh, next, please. Okay, so the third example that I want to, the third question that I think you can make is actually about researchers. And in this one, um, researchers obviously would like to know how their data and publications are accessed, and administrators would like to know which ones have more citations or, or not. And for researchers, we know we have our kids like this, and actually we can start asking questions about researchers' values in the ORCID at this, and ask questions such as how many citations does a researcher have? And again, uh, when you do a question like that, you will get, again, a standard response. Uh, here I'm using Henry Seppa, which I think is in the audience. Uh, and I'm getting everything that is connected uh, to him and the items that have been cited or related to the items that he have created. And if I transform that again to this, table just to give, you, to give you an idea of how this looks. You will get practically the, the main information about the research at the very top with a total count of all the data sets or publications that they have. And together with all the information, again, in the far right, that you will expect the repository. I know that Henry works for Imperial uh, College. Uh, so partly we know we are pretty sure that most of the information that's in the on the left of the, this table will be something that this data center of this repository already knows. But the part of the citations is some of that information that they might not know. And it is the things that the PID graph is bringing, bringing to, the, to the table and making accessible. Um, and the last case that I want to show you is about uh, software. And this one, I will jump immediately to the example and not show the JS response. And just to talk about like, you can make questions when you use uh, the PID graph, such as what software on the subject of global warming is out there and who is funding it. And you will get, again, a JSON response that you can transform it into a table or put it in your, uh, user, in your repository in your application and list all. And you will get every hit of that response will give you an item that is a piece of software um, that actually and the rel relation that has with any funding body that, the, that you have, and I, I think you can see one here and probably the, the four row, which is one piece of software that I use for global warming and uh, studies that is actually funded by the National Science Foundation. And this is the kind of questions that you can make that are not only that require that due to the power that we have with the PIDs connections, but also that you can make queries over those connections, you can answer questions such as this. And so I think we can go to the next, uh, but I think this is the last one, yeah. So those are the four cases that I want to show you uh, today. Data centers, grants, researches, and software. Uh, there is a lot of work that we are still doing in the PID graph and the GraphQL API. And, and I 
think uh, I think Elena will have probably more uh, comments about this. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks, everyone. Um, so there are some questions coming in so we'll take some time to answer those feel free if you have other questions to share them uh, via the Q&A or also in the chat if that's easier um, so here I see one question that has already been answered according <laughs> to a second message from the same person but let me ask it anyway just for the benefit of others um, so in the pit graph how does one distinguish funder from grants who wants to take that uh, this is Martin. I can take that. And you, you sort of um, have answered yourself that in the data set metadata, we have um, the distinction between the funder and the grant uh, in the metadata. And you can have obviously funding of multiple grants and multiple funders for the same data set or item. Um, I, I want to raise one challenge here, which is typical for pit graph. Uh, that funder identifiers is pretty standardized and we all know how to use that, how to use in data set metadata and cross site metadata, uh, in open air metadata, but grant funding is still newer and that's partly because it's more complicated and there's sort of ongoing work of standardized grant identifiers, etc. That just shows a limitation of um, PITS and PIG graph in general, that there are always things that are more established in uh, a PIT is available, metadata that contains links is available, et cetera, and other things that are evolving. Organization identifier is another example where you will find hardly any links for raw identifiers because that's a new identifier. Um, yeah, so that just sort of for things like grants to keep that in mind, and I see there's more questions. Yeah, so I see a very interesting one in Q&A. Um, the amount of pits we will need for this pit graph to work is virtually unlimited. Is this sustainable? Who will create and more importantly maintain all these pits so that they do not get duplicated? Thinking not just of pits we're starting to envision like grants or org ideas, but also of pits for research equipment or for patents, for instance. So I guess, Martin, you might want to take that as well. Uh, again, a very good question. I think, um, yeah, there's different ways you can answer that. One of them would be that the pit graph tries to describe what exists. And um, obviously, there are things that are easier to describe because, for example, you take pits for research data repositories, there's only two and a half thousand. So that's very easy. Organizations, research organization might be a hundred thousand and samples and data sets might be in the millions or billions. So that's, that's just the fundamental problem of these things. Um, so I would not think that we would create extra pits for the pit graph, but that this limits us of what we can do. And I think there has to be, uh, yeah, uh, I think, Something um, that we didn't say specifically in this webinar, but that is very important for us, that in the Freya project, we are building production grade infrastructure. So everything we are building can scale to millions and many millions of things. And that's sort of one reason we picked GraphQL as a technology, um, because that's obviously a challenge uh, when you scale this up. It's also, uh, on the other hand, the question of what kind of graph is really relevant to you. And since we, uh, since I know from what direction you're coming from, I would say that the graph for the institution might be very big, but that's still much more focused on, on a much larger graph that goes sort of across the whole discipline, for example. So I think doing something that is as focused as possible and then see where you can scale up and what's the trade-off uh, if you add lots more things, does it slow you down or complicate the graph? That's very important. Uh, there's also something that some pits are very good in making your graph distinguishable and other pits create a lot of noise. For example, pits for funders and institutions that potentially connect everything to everything, whereas uh, grants and researchers, for example, in this case, are much more specific and make it easier to see the specific connections.
Okay, thanks. Um, the next question they, that came in, maybe I missed it, but how far is the integration of raw IDs as paid for organizations? So maybe Robin, you want to answer that? Sure, yeah. So, um, so the raw registry exists. Um, it is it is live. It is able to be used um, in terms of integrating with data site uh, services and data site metadata. Um, currently, as part of the metadata working group, we are looking at um, including RoAR IDs, including an affiliation identifier in the metadata that we could put a RoAR ID in. Because um, while the registry is live, there's actually currently not a space in the data site metadata schema to put an affiliation identifier. You're able to specify an affiliation for a creator, but there's not an actual field for an identifier for an affiliation. So uh, we're working on that um, short, that should be out shortly um, in the next miners uh, schema version that's coming. Um, and so then once that's in place, we'll be able to use the ROAR ID for its primary intended purpose of identifying relations. Um, it, it is currently possible to use it as a name identifier for an organizational creator. That's something that you could do, uh, but that's not really uh, the same as using it for an affiliation identifier. And so we're working on that piece. So the registry exists. We just got to incorporate it with data site stuff. Um, so I also saw a question in chat. In the future, how might one attach context to a data citation? Was the data reused or not? Was the data replicated, etc.? cetera? Uh, Christian, maybe you want to answer that? Mm, I think at the moment, well, I mean, uh, at the moment we have, yeah, it's true that at the moment we have not looked into adding that into the schema uh, in, a, in a way, or actually, on the events, so how the events are created. It's an interesting question. Um, and definitely something probably we have to look as part of the future projects related to make data count. But yeah, I don't think that I have a satisfactory answer for that one at the moment. I, I would add to that, that in our presentations, we have very much focused on the resources or the nodes and with what they are connected with, but we haven't really <clears throat> talked much that the connections, for example, between a data set and a publication also can have meaning. So a data site and its colleagues, they can have relation type of obviously there's a date when this connection was made and also somebody who did that. So there's a lot of context in these connections that uh, you can expose also with GraphQL, but we haven't really focused much on that to say, I only want to see citations of a certain kind, et cetera. Yeah, and, and maybe I can add that um, in our webinar last month, we talked about the work we're doing around uh, looking at views and downloads and citations of data sets and making that available. So that webinar is also available through our YouTube channel. Um, so a couple more questions have come in. Zenodo uses something called a concept DOI, a mini pit graph, if you will. How does that relate to pit graphs or is it simply a staging post towards that aim? I guess, Martin, you might want to. Yeah, I would say um, uh, <clears throat> some of us in the Freya project had an in-person workshop last year to get this pit graph work started and uh, we collected use cases and tried to summarize them. And um, one very important one that came out in this is, is versioning. Uh, versioning of data sets and software is obviously very common and can get very complicated. And there are some issues currently that are sort of not fully addressed. What uh, Zenodo is doing is basically versioning of DUIs um, to make it easier uh, for example, if somebody cites a specific version, that you can aggregate all the citations to different versions together. That's what uh, this um, concept identifier is good for. Um, there is also of the fear that if you create data sets, if, you are, if they are too granular, which is good for specificity, uh, it makes it harder to aggregate all the citations, for example, the data repository gets together. 
And with the pit graph, uh, you can address these questions where it's just, you have much more flexibility how you aggregate things together. And Christian showed sort of example of that for, for a repository. Okay, great. Um, so someone said a great idea, so thanks. Um, will the pit graph support analytical queries as well? such as give me the researchers sorted descending by the number of citations to their publications, data sets and software produced within the last five years. Now who wants to answer that? Well, if that's a use case, we definitely will look into implement it, I guess. Yeah. So, um, I'm not sure how many people in this call are familiar with GraphQL because at the end of the day, this is a normal API that you see many places for all kinds of services. Um, so the short answer is everything you can do, well, basically everything you can do with REST API, you can also do with GraphQL with some, some things being easier and others more difficult. So it's not just connecting pits together, but for example, we already support standard queries. So you can, and I just showed an example with about climate. Uh, uh, we sorting, um, uh, pagination, all these things are of course also part in GraphQL and that allows you to to build all kinds of sophisticated uh, queries but as Christian said that's not probably not something that's sort of uh, in the very near future um, because it, it, it goes deeper and deeper but it's it's definitely something that's possible and that that's something we are willing to do if there's enough demand for that. Okay. Um, so we also have a question. Central registries for different types of globally unique pits seem to be at the core of the graph being workable. Which ones are missing? So I don't know, Martin, if you want to take that as well. Um, yeah, yeah. So one that's currently missing is uh, querying for Crossref DYs. And obviously that's, that's a very large number and very interesting content. Um, but Crossref is another partner in, in Freya. So this is something that will happen. Um, I think the bigger challenge is if you have the same data type in many different places. So if you, for example, um, identifiers for funders or organizations, people, there might be more than one option, but it's relatively straightforward. But if you look for publications and data sets, you have to look in so many different places that I think that's, that's a really hard challenge that we haven't really uh, started to address in combining not just the data sets from one API, but the publications from another API, but uh, of course, there are many publications with data set DUIs. There are close to 2 million data sets with cross -set DUIs. And how you bring all this together, that's not trivial. The specific question regarding cross -set DUIs uh, in the Freya project, we have this month started working on a sort of common DUI search, uh, which will make these kinds of things uh, very feasible. OK, final question of the day. Um, at the end of the project, will this give universities an overview of all their research outputs? So Robin, do you want to answer that? Not exactly. I mean, so some of this could be possible, but at the end of the Freya project, we will not have a service where you as a university could, you know, go to a website and put in your name and see everything related to you, not, not at this point in time. Um, so we will, we are making the infrastructure that will enable that kind of thing to be possible, but at the end of Freya, that will not yet be a thing. That is definitely something that we're interested in, in looking at in general for our, um, at least for the data site members. Um, in the future to be able to see information about themselves and what's happening with their DOI. So that kind of thing is on our radar to plan for for later. But within the context of Freya, um, 
no no magic buttons or anything as of yet. It's just the infrastructure piece that we're solving. Uh, I would like to add something to that, uh, which is that I, I fully agree with what Robin said, and I see this more as complementary, which is making it easier for institutions to enhance the information they already have. And maybe, for example, they have some pieces, publications, data sets, orchids for people, et cetera, that can be used as starting points to find more connections, which is, of course, basically what risk systems are doing and where uh, commercial vendors charge money for. This is also what Research Graph has been doing for several years as they have something called the Augment API. And that is something similar that we're envisioning here that if you have 100 orchids for researchers in your institution, you have a lot of information already, but uh, we might find additional things that you don't know, in particular, if you follow the graph over more than one connection. So that's definitely not the the magic bullet, but it certainly should improve this information that is available to institutions. Um, depending on how they do this now, this might be a big win or a small win. If they have a twist system that's full established, that's probably a smaller win, but uh, fundamentally there will always, it's always possible that there's additional information found via this technology. Um, GraphQL has another interesting feature which we didn't talk about, and that's sort of a little bit further in the future, but that's subscriptions. So you can also take these queries and then get notifications whenever there is something new um, that has appeared. And that, of course, makes it much easier to keep track of the things that are uh, of interest in your graph. OK. Um, I'd like to leave that this for today. So thanks, everyone for joining. As I said, the recording uh, will be made available via our YouTube channel. And uh, we hope to see you again next time.